Hey, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're going to be discussing valuation and valuation multiples here. Now, I want to say up front that we have covered elements of this topic before in the tutorials on equity value and enterprise value and EBITDA. And there are some older valuation lessons here as well, but I think it's helpful to combine everything or at least talk about all the main topics in one single video and give you a bit of a crash course on the key concepts, the calculations, and some examples. If you want everything here in writing, the screenshots, the Excel examples, the company documents, you can go to this URL, just go to our valuation section of our knowledge base and then valuation multiples. I'll also pin this URL in the comments below as the first comment so you can easily click it and go there. As usual, I'm gonna start off with the very short answer here and then we'll go into some more detailed explanations on aspects of this topic. So a valuation multiple equals a company's equity value or enterprise value divided by a key financial or operational metric such as revenue, EBITDA, or net income. It tells you how cheap or expensive a company is relative to other similar companies in the market. Now I said in the first bullet point that you could use either equity value or enterprise value and there's a lot of confusion about this point. The simplest way to decide is that if the metric in the denominator subtracts the net interest expense or it represents just the common shareholders, you want to use equity value in the numerator. Otherwise, if it does not subtract the net interest expense or, or it represents all the investors, you use enterprise value in the numerator. So for example, with net income, you use equity value because net income deducts interest expense on the income statement, but with EBITDA, you use enterprise value because it does not deduct the net interest expense. Also, EBITDA is available to all the investors in the company. But to understand what valuation multiples really mean, I think it is helpful to go through a real life example and to think about buying a house where you're thinking about two houses, one that costs $200,000 and one that costs $500,000. And the question is, which one is more expensive? On the surface, the $500,000 one seems more expensive, but the reality is we need more information to tell because it depends on how big each one is. It depends on their locations, their conditions, their ages, their amenities, other things like that. If both houses are exactly the same, then it's quite easy. If they're both 3,000 square feet, for example, then it's obvious that the 500,000 one is more expensive because you're paying more on a per square foot basis for the house. Where it gets complicated is when the houses are different sizes, especially when they're very different sizes. So for example, let's say that the $200,000 house is 1,000 square feet, but then the $500,000 house is 5,000 square feet. In this case, you really have to look at it on a per square foot basis or per square meter basis if you're outside the US. And if you do that, you can see pretty easily that the first one is $200 per square foot, but the bigger house, the $500,000 one is $100 per square foot. And so even though $500,000 is more, you're actually getting more for your money with this one than you are with the smaller house right here. Valuation multiples do the same thing but for companies rather than houses. And they normalize for the size differences between companies to see at a quick glance, which one is cheaper and which one is more expensive. So for example, let's say that you are looking at a subscription software, a SaaS company with an enterprise value of 800 million, and then another one with an enterprise value of 500 million. The first one, company A, has $200 million of revenue, and the second one, company B, has $75 million of revenue. Company A's revenue multiple, its enterprise value divided by its revenue is 4x, while company B's enterprise value divided by revenue is 6.7x. So on the surface, it seems like company B is more expensive. You have to pay more for each dollar of revenue that you get with company B, but we need more information to decide if it's undervalued or overvalued, and this is the key mistake people make. They often just stop here and say, okay, company A is cheaper than company B, company B is more expensive than company A, but they need to go deeper and look at the growth rates and the margins and the markets and the long-term outlook and a lot of other factors. Valuation multiples are just the starting point. They're not the ending point for valuation. So that's the short version. Let's now talk about these topics in more detail. I'm gonna start with some example valuation multiples across different industries. Then we'll go into a few calculations. I will explain the theory behind valuation multiples and then I'll explain why the theory often fails in real life and how you should think about this topic instead. So let's start with some common valuation multiples. Probably the three most common ones that you'll see all the time are enterprise value divided by revenue, enterprise value divided by EBITDA, and then equity value divided by net income, which is also known as the PE multiple or price per share divided by earnings per share. 
basically the same thing with a few minor differences in some cases. And all these are telling you essentially what you are paying for each $1 in revenue or each $1 in EBITDA or each $1 in after-tax profits. There are variations like enterprise value to EBIT, which is somewhat different because unlike EBITDA, it does indirectly factor in the company's capital costs because it deducts the depreciation and amortization of capital expenditures from previous periods. In terms of the pairing, as I mentioned up front, if a metric deducts the net interest expense or it represents just the common shareholders, you want to use equity value. I have a funnel structure over here to illustrate the idea. For example, with unlevered free cash though, it does not deduct interest expense because it's unlevered. And so therefore you use enterprise value with it. But with levered free cash though, you are deducting the interest expense. And so therefore you want to use equity value with it. Now there are also industry specific valuation multiples. There are probably dozens, but we're just going to cover a few of the most common ones here. In the banking and insurance industry, price to book value, price to tangible book value, and PE are all very common. PE is not really industry specific, but it is much more important for these types of companies. Book value is also critical and it represents just the common shareholders. So it pairs with equity value. You take equity value and divide by book value to, to create the price to book multiple. With natural resources, you will often take enterprise value and divide it by things like the proved resources or the daily production of an oil and gas company, or for a mining company, the mineral equivalent resources or reserves or something like that. With REITs, there are metrics like funds from operations and adjusted funds from operations, which we've covered in separate tutorials. You pair equity value with both because these both deduct the net interest expense and therefore the appropriate pairing is equity value, not enterprise value. With power and utilities, you'll see metrics like enterprise value divided by their REIT base, which essentially represents how much they can potentially earn with all their assets under current utility laws. You'll also see things like enterprise value to their total production or power production capacity. And then with SaaS companies and tech companies in general, you'll see multiples like enterprise value to monthly active users and enterprise value to annualized recurring revenue or ARR. Let's go through a few calculations now so you can get a sense of how you might use these concepts in real life. We're going to use Target, one of our favorite example companies here, and you can get the Excel file and the PDFs if you follow the link below the video. So step one is that you wanna calculate the EBITDA based on operating income, depreciation and amortization on the cash flow statement, and then you add back any non-recurring charges. Step two is to calculate enterprise value by starting with equity value or the share price times the diluted shares, subtract cash, add debt, and you may factor in other items depending on how complicated you wanna make the calculation. And then you compare targets multiples to those of its peer companies and see if they can tell you anything useful. So let's go into Excel and look at a quick example. I've already calculated an equity value and enterprise value here. I just took the company's share price as of the other day, October 7th, 2024. I'm taking their diluted shares from one of their recent filings. And then we're just taking cash from the balance sheet, debt from the balance sheet. I'm adjusting slightly for the market value and I'm subtracting cash and adding debt to get to the enterprise value. For the valuation multiples here, for EBIT and EBITDA specifically, if you pull up the company's 10K, you can get their operating income. So I'll enter this as 5,707,000,000. With non-recurring charges, at first glance, there doesn't really appear to be much of anything on the income statement. If we scroll down to the cash flow statement, let's just do that and see what we find. We do see depreciation and amortization, but nothing else here really stands out as a specific non-recurring charge that we should be adding back. So we could spend some more time looking at this and go through the filings, but I'm just going to say there are no non-recurring charges, add this up, and then let's take our depreciation and amortization, the 2,801,000,000 number, and then we'll add these up to get to EBITDA. One other thing we often do with valuation multiples is instead of just stopping at the last fiscal year, we take the LTM or last 12 months figures by taking the last fiscal year adding the most recent half year numbers or the most recent three or nine month numbers, depending on the timing, and then subtracting those same numbers from the previous period. So I'm doing that right now with this calculation for operating income and for everything below it until we get to EBITDA down here. Now, once we have that, we can then take enterprise value and divide by EBIT. And then we can take enterprise value and divide by EBITDA to get to our enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. And so these are some of the most common multiples that you'll see all the time in company valuation. 
Now, if we go over to the page with the public comps here, we have a couple of different US retailers, Dollar General, Costco, Walmart, Dollar Tree. And if you look at the numbers here, we clearly have two groups here. We have Costco and Walmart that are trading at much higher multiples than everyone else. Target is sort of in between these two groups, though they're much closer to the smaller group here of Dollar General and Dollar Tree. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of insight into this particular group of comps because basically all it's telling us is that, yes, these companies are growing their revenue at different rates. The rates aren't really that much different. Really, the main difference here is simply size. The companies with much bigger revenue and EBITDA figures are simply trading at higher multiples. The ones with much lower revenue and EBITDA figures are trading at much lower multiples. So this particular set of comparable public companies is not super insightful. And unfortunately, there just aren't that many retailers of Target's size range in the US, which is part of the problem here. Now I want to get into the theory behind valuation multiples and show you why this also explains some of their limitations. So the big idea here is that you can link any valuation multiple with a company's return on invested capital or return on equity. For enterprise value-based multiples, you use ROIC. For equity value-based multiples, you use ROE. So here's an example for the enterprise value to EBIT multiple. I just picked it because this is one of the simpler formulas. You can write this formulaically by saying that it equals the return on invested capital minus the EBIT growth rate. Then you divide by the ROIC times WAC, the weighted average cost of capital, minus the EBIT growth rate. Then you multiply by one minus the tax rate here, which you're doing because EBIT is before taxes. I'm not gonna go through the full derivation or show you how it's equivalent. This is just the idea because I wanna focus on the intuition behind it and some of the problems this creates. At a high level, what this says is that if a company is growing more quickly, it should trade at a higher multiple. And if its discount rate, its WAC is higher, it should trade in a lower multiple. You know that because ROIC is in the numerator, so if this goes up, the numerator goes up, and the denominator will also go up, but if you look at the way this works, since we're multiplying in the denominator, the numerator is always going to go up by more when the ROIC increases. And then similarly with the growth rates, if you think about how this works, since we are subtracting the growth rate from WAC in the denominator, when the growth rate increases, the denominator gets pushed down to a lower level. The numerator also changes, but overall, there's more of an impact on the denominator, so the overall multiple goes up. And then, of course, WAC itself. If you plug in numbers here and you try WAC at 15%, you're going to get a bigger denominator. If you try it at 10%, you're going to get a smaller denominator. So this is the basic intuition behind most valuation multiples. You have to look at growth rates, returns-based metrics, and also the discount rate of the company. The problem with this formula is that it assumes that all of these numbers are constant over time because the company has reached stability. And in real life, this hardly ever happens. Even if it does, it could take years or decades to get there, which is why you often have to project 10, 15, or 20 years to get to the terminal period in a DCF. Now I want to talk about why valuation multiples are often less useful in real life than they would seem based on the theory. First of all, there's the stability problem. Hardly any public companies have metrics that are staying the same over time. So even if there is some correlation between a higher ROIC and higher multiples, it's not going to be a very strong correlation. It's going to be quite messy if you look at the actual data. Another problem is that sometimes the sets of comparable companies are not so great. You saw this with Target where this set isn't really telling us about the company's growth rates or how they correlate with the revenue multiples or the EBITDA multiples or anything like that. Really just telling us that bigger companies in this market trade at higher multiples, which is not super useful. Multiples also reflect short-term events, thinking and expectations, not the long-term picture, the 10 or 20 year picture for companies. And then finally, there are accounting differences, especially around lease accounting. The rules changed back in 2019 and a lot of companies are still dealing with it. People are still confused about how to set up analyses. We have other tutorials on this topic, so I'm not going to get into it here, but it is somewhat confusing and it can create discrepancies in valuation multiples. The bottom line is that you wanna think about valuation multiples as going to the doctor and getting a blood test or a blood pressure check when you're doing an annual physical. In other words, they can't tell you if you're perfectly healthy or if you have a serious problem, but they can indicate that you may want to look into something or do further tests or examinations to see if something is a problem or not. With companies, it's the same. A simple multiple can't tell you if a company is mispriced, but it may suggest that a company might be worth digging into and doing some more research on, figuring out the market, building a full model, and then building a long-term DCF to value it.
That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. Example valuation multiples, enterprise value to EBITDA, EBIT, and revenue, and then price to earnings or equity value to net income are probably the most common ones. There are also many industry-specific ones, which we covered before. For the calculations, I showed you this example for Target. It's not too complicated. You have to calculate EBITDA based on the income statement and cash flow statement. You can take the LTM version by taking the last fiscal year, adding the most recent partial period and subtracting the same partial period from the year before. And then you just pair each one with either enterprise value or equity value, depending on what's in the denominator, if it subtracts interest expense or if it does not subtract interest expense. The theory behind valuation multiples says that essentially a company's multiple should be higher if it's ROIC or growth rates are higher, and they should be lower if it's discount rate or WAC is higher. In real life, this is often true in a very rough sense, but you can't interpret it too literally because the real world data is just too messy and the assumptions in those formulas do not hold up in real life. So instead, you want to think about valuation multiples as a way to screen companies, to figure out if something looks strange, and to determine if you want to do further work on one company before making an investment recommendation, investing yourself, or advising a client in some way. That's about it for our tutorial on valuation multiples. Hopefully now you have a better sense of what they are, some common examples, the calculations, the theory, and also why the theory doesn't always hold up in real life.